Good morning. I'm Brenda Nevajan, and you'll hear from uh, Diane in just a minute. Uh, first of all, we'd like to recognize uh, our committee. We had quite a journey beginning back in the fall, um, back prior to the finalization of the election, um, and had many interesting segue conversations um, as we planned the workshop for today. I think uh, Dr. Tulski has captured what we hoped to bring to you all um, that was um, from concept to action and success in, in that action, and I believe um, you will see that through the course of today. We are um, starting, as you will notice from the agenda, we are starting setting the stage with the voice of the patient, and, and in this case, family and provider. We had that happen in last, um, the last uh, workshop and found that very powerful for setting the stage, and we're very fortunate to be able to continue that tradition uh, with, with this workshop. And you'll notice we start broadly and then get very focused as the day goes on with many exemplars of what people are doing out in the field, not just in um, academia, as uh, Dr. Tulski mentioned. Um, there are um, some housekeeping details that I'm charged with. I would uh, just mention to you at the uh, last of the agenda, there is a notes page that has some really basic information for you. Um, we also have a, a Twitter handle and, and, and other kinds of things. So those of you who are uh, into social media, we encourage you to use the, uh, the Twitter handle that uh, is hashtag it's on the screen um, the hashtag there it's a very long one uh, we we took a it's not ours it's the major round table we took a long time discussing what that handle should be and it, it shows <laughs> so we do encourage uh, those of you um, who are in, in that uh, uh, social media environment to, to please uh, do that we also have built in very consciously uh, in the in the um, whole program a uh, time for dialogue, discussion, Q&A. And we do have microphones. Uh, because this is live streaming, we ask that when you have a, uh, something to contribute to the discussion that you go to the microphones and that when you do get your opportunity to speak that you say who you are and where you are from. Uh, as I mentioned, it is being live streamed, so we do have some people out there in the virtual environment and we welcome them this morning uh, as well. Um, at this point, oh, restrooms, I should mention that. If you haven't found them, are out this door and around the corner, sort of over there, um, and you know the refreshments are out in that um, a foyer area. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague um, in crime here. And it was a wonderful journey, and I learned a lot yes. from Diane we along had, the way we as had well. Fun. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm happy this day is here, and uh, when I think back to when we all got started in this work, the fact that this day is here is nothing short of a secular miracle. Um, I uh, also want to, from the bottom of my heart, thank our committee. So we had a lot of process to get to the content of this meeting, and a lot of diverse voices, and there were times when it felt like we would never get to yes. But the result was a very high quality um, group of presenters and a very broad range of content. So I want to thank the committee for not just being there in name, but actually being there in heart and mind as well to get us to this point. How do I advance slides here? Is there a, okay. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page with definition. So I'm giving you the definition of palliative care here um, so that we know what we're talking about. It's specialized care for people with serious illness. This type of care is focused on providing relief from the symptoms, thank you, and stress of a serious illness. Um, the goal is to improve the quality of life for the patient and the family. So if you Google what is palliative care, this is what comes up. So this is how I was trained in a model where we did everything, did everything, did everything, did everything, and then for some reason today we decided, oh, time for hospice. As if yesterday, not time, today, yes, time, as if that has anything to do with the experience of patients, and clearly it doesn't. And those of us who came up and were trained in that environment were increasingly uncomfortable with it, and that led 
um, to the inception of the field of palliative care, which recognized there's plenty of quality of life challenges from the point of diagnosis of a serious illness and throughout the course of that illness, whether it gets cured, whether you live with it for a decade as a chronic disease, or whether it's progressive. Um, and this is a better image um, because it shows that people get better, they get sicker again, they get better, they stabilize. It's up, down, up, down, up, down. It's not linear. So um, let's think about it. Where is palliative care easily accessible in the United States? Two places, hospice and hospital. And what is the problem with that? Most people with serious illness are not dying and most people with serious illness are not in the hospital. So there's this huge gap in the middle, which is where the great majority, you know, upwards of 99% of people with serious illness are there in the community. They're at home, they may be in assisted living or nursing homes, they get care through their doctor's offices, and that is a huge gap in access to high quality palliative care. So hospice, everybody I hope knows, eligibility is restricted by, by statute, by law, to people who two doctors say are going to live for less than six months and who agree, actually sign a piece of paper, to give up their regular Medicare coverage for disease treatment or, quote, curative treatment. 46% um, of Americans get some hospice before they die. These are the latest data NHPCO has, 2014. Unfortunately, the median length on hospice is only 17 days, meaning half of people get less than 17 days. In fact, 35% get less than a week and 10% less than 24 hours. So because of that first bullet, the eligibility criteria meaning people have to you know, say, yep, I'm dying, I'm willing to give up treatment, it's a very late referral. Um, so even though it is intended to be a six-month benefit, in reality, it's a two-week benefit. 60% of hospice people are cared for at home, much lower than you might think. 30% are in some kind of facility, whether it's nursing home, residential hospice, or hospital. And 84% are Medicare beneficiaries over age 65. And so that's what we're talking about with hospice, predominantly older adults. And outcomes consistently show better quality of life, not only for the person with serious illness, but also for their family, and significantly lower overall Medicare spending if the length of stay is under six months. Um, this is the, there's been a doubling in the number of hospices in the U.S. since the year 2000, which is why I say it's easily accessible. And by, if you travel the world, far more accessible in the United States than anywhere else despite the belief that, you know, the UK has it all sewn up, we have much better access in this country. Um, this is a map, though, like everything else in the US, there's enormous variation, geographic variation in access. And so the darker green, more than 60% of Medicare beneficiaries get hospice. You see Texas, Florida, Arizona, um, and the, the blue, uh, between 20 and 40 percent. So your care depends on where you live in every possible way. Uh, this is hospital palliative care growth in the U.S. from about 600 programs in 2000 to something close to 1,750 at present, serving about 8 million people a year. Um, the number of patients served has tripled. Um, every U.S. News and World Report, Honor Hospital, Adult and Children have palliative care programs. All of the top NIH-funded hospitals have them. The virtu virtually all teaching hospitals have palliative care, and nearly 90% of NCI-designated cancer centers have palliative care. But again, look at the variation. So um, the orange, uh, it gets it. Those are states that get a grade of D, meaning only 20 to 40 percent of their hospitals have palliative care teams. The dark blue is an A. Between 80 and 100 percent of their hospitals have palliative care teams. So again, enormous variation. What I'm not showing you here is how markedly this has improved over the last 10 years. There were a lot of F states the first time we did this report card. There are no F states anymore. There were three A states. There are way more A states now. So real progress has been made. 
Uh, the data is very clear um, that palliative care and hospice improve the value equation, improve quality in the numerator on the left, and by improving quality, by improving quality, lead to reduced costs. So it's not rationing. It's meeting people's needs so that they don't call the ED at 3 and call 911 at 3 in the morning for a pain crisis because there is no pain crisis. And very consistent data on marked reduction in spending um, and marked improvement in quality. I'm going to skip this because we don't have time. But unfortunately, it's animated. <laughs> so what do we, I showed you access to hospice. I showed you access to hospital palliative care. What do we know about access to community-based palliative care? Nothing. We know nothing. We have no data. Um, we have no annual surveys about access to this kind of care. We have bright lights that Brenda and I have been gathering for your education um, today. But um, I, would, I would argue that accessibility is at best poor to these kinds of community-based serious illness models. So how do we get? to a point where we can say we have the same access to community-based serious illness models as we do to hospital palliative care or hospice. So today's sessions are going to demonstrate really a stunning number of remarkably creative and effective community-based serious illness care models that shift care for patients out of EDs and hospitals and into their communities. As you're listening today, listen for the common characteristics. Things like attention to social determinants. Things like 24-7 access. Things like professional skill in managing pain and symptoms. Things like interdisciplinary teams. They're pretty consistent. Um, and then I'd, I'd say what today is going to prove is that this can be done. It's not that hard. Um, consistent outcomes are achieved by a very broad range of models in a very broad range of care settings and parts of the country. How do we get from you have to be lucky to this is the standard of care? And that we hope will be addressed in the next two workshops. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and invite uh, Vicki Garrett and David Garrett and Colleen Tallon to join me up here. <laughs>